and welcome to the Heroic Review, the internet show where we, the cast and crew of the Heroic Tales, discuss fan fiction, episodes, and other ponylicious things. My name is Deadly Reg. I play the amazing Mr. Waddle in the Heroic Tales, and I'm the moderator for this discussion. Joining me, as per usual, is a panel of pony experts. We have Brained by Saucepans. Good day, fair folk. Umbasa. Hello, everybody. Ilya. Good afternoon, evening, or morning. Reverb. Hello, everyone. And Scribbler. Hiya! This time, we're going to be taking a look at the fanfic The Incandescent Brilliance by Kitsune Risu. As Ilya has picked the fic this time, he has the honour of introducing it. Ilya, if you would give us the blurb. An accident occurs, leaving two ponies trapped in a room, with nothing to do but wait in an eternal field of stars. All right, the general overview that we'll give is just to briefly touch on the tags, which is tragedy, and then a brief summary of the story. Ilya, would you mind giving us a brief summary of the story? Well, I'll try to do that without being spoilery. Well, not yet, anyway. We will get spoilery later on. Well, that's true. The initial setup actually is a blurb is pretty much the whole of the plot. We have some characters trapped by an accident and they are left with nothing to do but wait in an eternal field of stars. The eternal field of stars is a metaphor here for death. I think that's a pretty good light description of the plot, would you say? Were there really metaphors in this story? Because I didn't notice. I will argue thoroughly that there was a metaphor in the story, but that the author did not pay enough attention to it. I'd go for that, yeah. I will argue that. Shall we give the synopsis before we start debating and pooping all yeah. over it? Okay, so the synopsis is our main character, Trixie Lula Moon, is trapped with one of her research assistants. They're working on a project, and the project has trapped them in the chamber. They recant and go over major aspects of their lives while they're waiting for the accident to finally kill them. And then toward the end of the story, Trixie and Twilight Sparkle have a frank conversation about their feelings towards one another and their relationship as it has developed over the course of 30 years. Then terrible things happen just at the end. Everyone happy with that? That's basically it. Okay. Indeed. Who would like to go first with their overall opinion of the story? Because I'm happy to. Why do I get the feeling that you and Saucy are going to have the most to say this time? Based nothing whatsoever on the fact that you two have told me already today you've got a lot to say about this one. Okay, then I think for the sake of frankness, the first person to go should be Gumbasa. I enjoyed this story, but as soon as I loaded up the page for the first time and saw that the only tag for this story was tragedy, all I could say to myself was, oh boy, I'm in for a good time here. And sure enough, it was bleak, and it was sad, and it made my heart cry out in pain, and my god, can't we just get something happy that's not boring on this show for once? No, no. we have to. We all know how much you love tragedy, Gumbasa. The last time we tried a romantic comedy, it didn't end well. <laughs> that one was one of our... Very true. Yeah, we loved that story. Then let's get a better romantic comedy! You chose the last one! I think we should go to Ilya. Now, Ilya, you've done a reading of this fix, so obviously you've seen something in it. Would you like to give us your general opinion of it overall? Well, certainly. I mean, I generally picked this story because I intended to record it, which I did. And I'll usually choose a story going in based on how the feel of it is, how the words work together, how the descriptions are and things. And I really enjoyed that part going in. And the story turned out to be entertaining at least to me, but I did have a few quibbles here and there with things. Since we're going to save the best to last, Reverb, if you'd like to go next. I thought the story, while having a few gems and pretty good ideas hidden away within it, like Trixie's character, a couple of inspiring messages in the face of death, I found the whole story really deeply depressing right from the first word and had to really force myself through a second retake of this when it got chosen. But I loved the reading of it. Scribbly, if you like to do next. For the first time in a long time on Heroic Review, I'm pretty indifferent because I listened to this one three times now and I don't find it very pony. And that's my major gripe with it is I like the little bits of Trixie characterization that come in the last third. And I like the little bit of Twilight at the very, very end after the tragic bit has happened. But the actual initial setup and the leaps of logic I had to make to get to the opening premise, it felt like something that was from the Twilight Zone or 
Outer Limits or something like that rather than an MLP fic. Did other people get that same feel that it didn't feel like a pony fic? Initially, no. Yeah. The first time I listened to it, I was completely lost for the first third of it, just with the way it started. Same, same. I had a difficult time getting into it when it started, and it was only around the halfway point that I really started to get invested in the story, and that's when it really started to turn me around in terms of me liking it, was in the latter half. Actually, Ilya, I was going to ask, since you actually did the full reading of it, when you first read the story and obviously to decide whether or not you were going to do the reading, did you feel that it was Pony or not? And that affect how you did the reading in the end? Eh, that's a bit of a bone of contention. As often I do, I actually hadn't read the story before I recorded it. So I was discovering it as I recorded it. And I remember thinking that, what the hell is going on here? You know, and I just kept reading because that's what I do. But I rather felt that the phenomenon that they were investigating should have been explained a little bit up front. Oh, yes. We'll get into that later, I think. We will get into that. In fact, Saucy, if you'd like to give overall opinion, we could get into the specifics in just a sec. Well, uh, very perceptive of you, Scribbler, for picking up that I was not a fan of this one. My initial reading, I did sort of find myself quite enjoying certain aspects of it. But it's one of those fics where, where the more I look into it, and the deeper I dig, the more and more problems I've found. And I'm starting to think I hate this story. And I know I'm becoming a bit of a stuck record, you hear this a lot from me on this show. But yes, I have a lot of problems with this, and pretty much everything we're going to discuss I've got a major problems with. And we'll go into that. I actually feel very similar to how we felt about Puppet, and I'm going to give that to Saucy. Like Puppet... I think this is an okay story that would have been a great story if the author had known what the story was about. I sincerely believe the author did not know what story they were writing. I'd agree with that. I feel like there is a lot in here that, if it had been focused on, would have been a better story than it is. Saucy? The impression I get is definitely that this was a fic that was written as the author conceived of it, and it was written from start to finish, rather than being planned out in advance. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that, but I would agree that it's a story that was developed as it went along. And I wouldn't say it wasn't planned out in advance, but I would say that it needed at least one more draft from beginnings to take it down to what it could have been. Saucy. If there was a plan, I don't think they were stuck to it. Okay, the next point on the topic is the author's style. Did anyone want to say something particular about the style? It was very obtuse and difficult to penetrate at first. It was very florid. It managed to use a lot of words to say not very much at the very beginning. Kubasa? I found it very interesting in comparison to the other work that this author has done, because I did a reading of one of their other stories, Chess, which takes place entirely between the minds of two different characters, Twilight Sparkle and Princess Celestia. And it's interesting to me that it's a very different type of writing. I do agree that at first it's very difficult to get into this style, whereas in something else that they've written like Chess, it was very easy to slide into because it was very easy to tell what was going on from the start. Ilya, did you have anything to add here? Well, I think that probably one-room plays are difficult to pull off successfully, which is basically what this was. And I rather enjoyed the fact that it was weird, different. I sort of tend to am drawn to things like that. doesn't mean it was pulled off completely well, but it was interesting to me and in that aspect. A reverb, did you have anything you wanted to add here? Similar to Gumbasa, the only other story that I've read by this author was Chess. And the main similarity that I found between his two writing styles is they're both incredibly intense. And he gets rather purple pro-ish at times, especially as Scribbler was saying towards the start, just explaining this phenomenon like in just really, really nitty gritty detail. It would have been so much better if he took a step back and sort of explained the bigger picture of actually what's happening, especially for the start of the story, in my opinion. Ilya? I just realized at this moment that he's absolutely right about that. There was too much description in the beginning. That, I think that's one of the problems. If we could then have Scribbler, and then when Scribbler's finished, if we could have Saucy. 
I get the feeling that the opening of this story, it was so focused on description because it was trying to create a particular mood and it was one that the author was trying to maintain throughout the story. So it was almost like they felt they had to over-egg the pudding at the beginning to make sure that when they got into the actual dialogue, the mood maintained. Except that it really was a case of over-egging the pudding because I would have rather known what was going on than pretty language. So I think my main problem with this isn't the use of the pretty language. It's I get the impression that the author was just throwing in metaphors for the sake of using metaphors. I don't think they entirely knew what they were going for in that respect. And what really drove that home for me was a specific example. When they described the character of Russet at one point, they referred to him as he was a soldier fighting for the last few things that remained. And that just jumped out at me. It's like, why a soldier? That doesn't fit with how he's characterised. That doesn't fit with anything else in the story. It's just like they're throwing in metaphors for their own sake. And I'm not sure if anyone else got that impression at all. Except the fact that if he used like it was a simile. <laughs> Sorry, you couldn't let that one slip past because somebody would mention that in the comments. Yes. I have very pedantic fans. No, it's a metaphor. He was a soldier fighting for the last few things that remained. That is a metaphor. Okay. That is a metaphor. You are excused. Sorry, it's probably just me mumbling a bit. You know me. We know you. Well, mumble is an appropriate place. Okay, I think we've discussed the author's style sufficiently, so I'm going to actually jump onto what I think is the most contentious point here. Does the experiment matter? Barca. I never really got a good grasp of exactly what this experiment was supposed to be about because the end result is that it causes a void to open up that's slowly eating away the entire room around them but i can't really recall and it might just be because i found the beginning so difficult to get into i can't really recall what the point of the experiment was and anybody who does sciencey things knows that every experiment should have an end goal and a point in mind. The only thing I remember about the experiment is towards the end, Trixie was basically stating its importance to the future of what was going on, except beyond that, I mean, it was something that I was looking out for as well, and I don't think it was really mentioned that much, apart from, obviously, the nature of the black hole-like entity that was created within the magic boundaries. But um, I reckon it would have worked so much better if it was sort of like a twist ending or something like that, if it sort of was set up a bit better in the very start as sort of something to expect. And then if at the very end it was sort of turned around in some sort of twist way. But I mean, I'm trying to fix the story here. But yeah, I don't think it was really mentioned all that much. Saucy? I think the reason you're getting that impression is because the author dwelled on the experiment too much, in my opinion. I think it's quite clear that the experiment was just designed as a plot device of putting the characters in this situation. But then they got carried away with the florid prose, with all the metaphor, and ended up giving far too much detail to the point where we know enough to know that we don't know anything about it. And that means, as an audience, we want to know more about it. And that took the focus away from the real point of the story. So, see, I think that's the right of it. We learn absolutely nothing about the experiment because the experiment doesn't matter. We know that it is important and we know that it is destructive. That is all we need to know. We need to know that it has to happen. They wanted it to happen, but it has gone wrong. That is the only real things that needed to be defined about it. But the author wanted to describe it. Now, if we have the initial setup, which is confusing. It's a few sentences where it discusses the panic and then the evacuation. I thought that was appropriate because we want to get that sense of panic and brevity. But because then we are dwelling on the specific look and design, the appearance of the experiment, I thought it was visually very interesting. But it, certainly there was a lot of attention paid to it, to something that was just the plot device that got us there. And as you said, there was no reason to pay that much. It, it was too visually interesting at that point. Too much dialogue was paid to it. Too much attention was paid. Ilya? I sort of think it might have also been a bit of an experimental piece. It started out reading a bit like poetry. And you forgive me for that, but I'd been steeped in T.S. Eliot for the weeks before this. It began sort of poetic and then focused into prose. So it was a sort of like a story that was starting out a little blurry and moving toward a focus, which kind of worked in my mind. Gossip? But at that point, it sort of highlights the fact that, as we pointed out, the author was writing it without a real clear idea of how the story was going to go. If it started out more in one style of writing and then worked its way into another and then solidified there, 
that's a little off-putting. It's it's inconsistent. I'll give you that. The actual introduction where we spend so much time dwelling on the evacuation of the experiment is one of the the sins of the fic because the first experience we have as an audience is dwelling on this event when really what we should have been dwelling on was Trixie and Russet being trapped in the room. That should have been the start. The start is them being trapped in the room, but what we start with is the hasty evacuation and the experiment, which draws the attention initially to that. So that's the point we start on, and that's what colours everything that comes after it. Saucy? It was just self-indulgent in my view, that's the thing. It was indulging in the poetry of the metaphor and everything to the detriment of the rest of the fic. The description of the void feels like it was written first, and then author wanted a story to go around it. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it needed to be edited to reflect that. It, that description was, wasn't was a bad description. It was a great description. I thought it was very florid and very... It, it, it certainly gave you a mental picture of the void that was very colourful, but it was something that needed to be staggered throughout the story to give us more of an understanding of it as it went along by dumping all of that right at the start and then referencing back to it. We're constantly reminded of this thing that serves no purpose. That's a good point. Uh, Reverb, did you have something to add? One thing that I think could have been done a little better from the very start to kind of make it all make a little more sense in the grand scheme of things if it started with just, say, Trixie, for example, being unconscious and slowly coming to and slowly discovering this thing and sort of describing it in a half-conscious sort of state of not really understanding what's going on and then sort of coming to terms with what's happening with the audience. If you go back to Kabasa's original point that he was making there, if we have the writing style change over time and then solidify, certainly that would have been one perspective that could have been taken to produce that by having Strixie's state be an actual reflection of the narrative of the fic as, it's, as she slowly starts to come to terms with it, we as the audience do as well. Before we press on, Ilya, you said something in the chat before about the use of the definite article? Ah, yes. I just found that a bit odd. It was one thing that sort of took me out of the story. I was looking for the reason for that, and I never really found it. So it kind of, like you said, took me away from the plot. For the audience, what was it specifically about the use of the definite article that was leading you to be distracted? Well, it just began with the mayor did this, the... I, I can't recall all the these in there that I thought... Well, there were plenty um, of these, so certainly. Actually, that's a good point. There's a lot of use of that definitive article to illustrate what we have, as you've said, the mayor, the, the this and that. But then the author goes on to name the characters, to give further details of the situation. And it, it feels as though, certainly when we've seen this kind of writing before, when you lead with a definitive article, it's to produce a sense of anonymity about the information or giving the audience. Whereas in this case, we're seeing the definitive article and then we're seeing further explanation of the information that we're seeing. So it does come as distracting because it's not used for a specific purpose. We feel like there should be a reason that everything is being defined, but... That's exactly right. I was looking for the resolution, and I never found it. Certainly in the circumstances where I've seen the definitive article used, it's trying to inspire a thought of a strong archetype or to produce or to, to sort of reference something that your audience may already be familiar with and then to build on that, whereas in this, nothing was really built on other than the text itself. Kibasa? It's almost like when the author refers to the mayor, it's almost as if the author didn't really have a clear idea of which characters were going to be used when the story was started. As we get into it, I will say that I love the way that Trixie is characterized here, but the use of the article does make me feel as though the character choice was kind of arbitrary. Yeah. Could have been Pinkie Pie. <laughs> we'll get into that because I feel that the character was entirely arbitrary and I... We will get... Oh, yeah. we will get into we'll that. We'll get into but, that But we one. should probably discuss the most important part of the story, which is Russet. And that was a lie. <laughs> Russet is rubbish. So, what did we think of Russet? <laughs> oh, Russet, yes, because of course the story is entirely about Russet. He's such a vital character for this whole enterprise. So, what was your feelings about Russet, Scribbler? Boring. Boring as fuck. Okay, does anyone want to add to that, Kubasa? He's just there as an exposition machine and to give Trixie someone to talk to so that we don't spend the entire story just listening to Trixie's thoughts. 
I think if you're going to write a one-room play, particularly about two characters, one of those characters should not be the thing that is the exposition is said to. You can't have two characters, then one of them does nothing. Has anyone read any one-room plays where only one character has anything to say and it not be terrible? Fantastic. Okay. Reverb? One other thing that I thought he was there for was just to sort of experience and share all the suffering with the audience because Trixie was painted obviously as, you know, the strong character, the resolute, you know, I'm ready to die while he was, you know, we were made to feel his suffering through the entire thing, his bargaining with it, his wanting out, his depression, all the all the rest of the five I stages the of death. used as he was weeping with primal grief. I remember that term primal grief because it didn't feel a situation wherein primal grief would be an appropriate response. He was a terrible character. He was He was a soldier. Oh, he was a soldier in the war on something. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he was a baby. Like, oh, oh, my mum and dad who may or may not be Big Mac and Fluttershy. Oh, they they sold everything so I could come die here. Why won't they save me, Miss Trixie? And I have to say that I didn't catch that they were Big Mac and Fluttershy until I saw it in the schedule <sighs> for this discussion. Me either. I didn't realize that. It's sort of subtly hinted and there. Is that us reading too much into it, though? No, No, no. I'm pretty sure that was the author's intent. He owns a farm. She lives in a cottage at the outside of town. She's a Pegasus. There we go. Boom. Done. Okay. And who's specifically mentioned as having spent all her time with her animals. And he's specifically mentioned as not talking that much. And It's Big Mac and Fluttershy. It's Big Mac and Fluttershy. It's It's Big Big Mac Mac and Fluttershy. Okay, see, when you sum it up like that, it makes more sense. Hmm. I'm just going to put it out there that the reference to Big Mac and Fluttershy being a couple and Russet being their child is uh, completely unnecessary Yep. in the grand scheme of things. I felt that way too. It felt almost like the author threw it in specifically just to have some sort of pairing in a story about two ponies dying horribly by falling into a black void. I think we're in spoiler territory now, so yes, just... We were in spoiler territory the moment that we started talking about the greater plot at work here, I think. You can't discuss this at all without being in spoiler. I think that Russet, with the whole thing about Fluttershy and Big Mac and the rest of it, and all the questions about his backstory before we ever got on to Trixie, I think I see this sometimes. I've seen it a lot in really new authors when they've got an OC, and that OC's backstory is the most important thing in the world that they have to get across. It's not done naturally. It's a case of they have created this elaborate backstory for their OC, and God damn it, you're going to know it all before you have to see how awesome they are. And Russet may not be awesome, but we have to know his backstory. The fact that we had Russet's character established, his mother and father established as being canon characters, but in an obtuse manner, is, I thought at the time, quite clever, because then he doesn't have to go into any details about his backstory, but at the same time, he's explained enough of it in a way that makes sense to that character. He's mentioned his mother and father. We as an audience know it, but at the same time, he hasn't had to name them. There's been no name dropping, but we, we know who they are in the wider continuity. But then Russet keeps talking about his family and giving us more and more information that isn't relevant to the story. It doesn't feel relevant to Russet in it. I mean, his major character trait is he's embarrassed that his family bankrupted themselves so he could be a magic horse. But we didn't need to know this much. It just, uh, it's, it's, it's weird. It's, oh, I don't know. I can't put my finger on why I dislike it so much. Scribbler. The entire point of Russet was to build more on the tragedy of the story. Hey, because boss. losing Trixie wasn't enough. He was effectively a little Gary Stew character. That he had this tragic backstory. He's a good-hearted, pure, nice, innocent male character. And he's going to die horribly for no reason whatsoever. And it was meant to up the tragedy. His entire backstory, to me, felt incredibly manipulative. So yeah, it does feel incredibly manipulative. That must be what it is. Oh, yes. And that's something to laugh about. It is, actually. Yeah, horses dying horribly. Laugh about them. Uh Go on, laugh, damn it. To be fair, when Russet died, the Society of Equestria lost nothing. (laughs) I'll say that. Can I just ask something? This is a genuine thing. Because I said I listened to this story three times. I missed Russet's death every time, and Saucy told me that he died off screen. Is that right? He dies off screen. He, yeah. That's right. Basically, he's there one minute, and then Trixie goes into her monologue about herself, and at the end of it, he's just gone. Right. 
I wondered about that. I thought it was just mid something. He got swallowed up by the void while she was talking about her backstory, yeah. That annoyed me, because not ten minutes ago, he was screaming in primal grief, and he just goes quietly into the void without going, Ah, it's got me! It's got me, Miss Trixie! Yeah, because there was the point where she said, Twilight, it's got my leg, so it's not like it's just... Yeah, it's not like you, you're it grabs gone. you and you immediately die. You can notice you that it's happening. So, Russell was just, like, stoic and go like, Oh, I don't want to interrupt her. Or she might lose her place. Either that or her diatribe <sighs> just put him to sleep. I think it just sums up the character in that the fact that whether he's there or not doesn't matter at all. <laughs> <laughs> he dies and Trixie doesn't notice. All right, just quickly to go through something, there was a passage of time. There was a whole bunch of stuff. Ponyville's debut, Colchester. Did we think that did much to sell us on the fact that time has passed? Did we feel as though this was a plausible series of events? And were these plausible future interpretations of the character of Trixie and the events of the world? I'm going to hear a lot of no's. I don't think it was really necessary. There we go. Yeah, okay. Anyone else? The changing of the name, I didn't think, was very necessary. What was the point of that? And when did it happen? And why did it happen? It just, it raises too many questions, as Batman would say. Yeah, New Colchester? What? What's that? Does that mean it was Colchester at one stage and then was renamed to New Colchester again? No. Or was it renamed How twice? How new something works is you have the original city, which was Colchester, and then elements of Colchester will move to the site of New Colchester and lay down the foundations of that city. So they subordinated Ponyville in order to found New Colchester in and around it. That's how colonization works. That's why we have cities like New York. And we've got places like New South Wales as well. Yeah, except that they wouldn't have made any sense. It doesn't make a lot of with sense, With the significance no. of Ponyville in the equestrian canon, the, the canon of the show and the, and the internal verisimilitude of the Pony franchise, Ponyville is important as Ponyville. As I established at the start, this is one of the many metaphors that the author does not use very well. It worked for me as a metaphor for something changing and becoming known differently and its past being erased, which is the point of the Trixie character, badly written as she is. All right, so is the story as emotionally manipulative as Snowblind? Fuck yes. Yes. She's called Snowdrop. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I... It's, really tr it's really trying hard to be emotionally manipulative, but it doesn't That's the whole quite purpose understand of how to do it. He's weeping openly because he's going to die in a bucket. Oh god, this just that's part of the reason why the Russet character is so quote unquote bland, so open because it's intended partially as a self-insertion character. Every character that's like that where the personality is sketched so thinly is intended for you to be able to empathize with them in the quickest and easiest way possible by giving them no significant character traits. You allow your reader to empathize with them because nothing has been expressed that is contrary to their opinions. Uh, reverb then scribbler please. It's hard for me to imagine this story wasn't born out of the idea of trying to make something purely tragic and soul-crushing just for the sake of it. I wouldn't say it's soul-crushing. Especially that ending. That ending, yes, I agree with you. Scribble it. I'm going to be the one who's playing devil's advocate here, that I think that some of the bits with Trixie and the things that she was saying to Twilight and the very end where she was insisting that Twilight shut up and let her say things... And there was one particular line that I thought was actually quite good in the tragedy of the fic. I, it was when she said um, she was putting all of her awards in a drawer and wouldn't look at them. Because she said, if I keep looking back at what I've done, I'm not going to look forward to what I can do. And that line in the context of, yeah, but you're going to die and you know it. That for me worked quite well as part of a tragedy because that was subtle enough. Good gossip. I actually think that the fic manages to be both manipulative and organic at the same time. In terms of Russet, yes, it did feel very emotionally manipulative, trying to get us to care about an original character who is going to die, who we are meant to feel emotionally attached to in the short time that we know him. But in terms of Trixie, I do feel that it feels much more genuine in how it portrays her and how uh, I just feel like the use of Trixie in her relation to Twilight feels much more genuine than Trixie's relation with Russet. 
I think now we'll move on to Trixie. Let's discuss Trixie. Do you mind if I start this one off? You may. Right. Let's ignore this fic entirely. What would people say Trixie's defining characteristics are? Brashness. Arrogance. Ego. Being bombastic. Loud. She is loud. She's an entertainer. Being the centre of everything. Selfish. Right. Now let's conflate that with how this character is portrayed in this particular fic. Describe this character. That's not fair. Yeah, but this is 30 years down the line, Trixie. I know, but I still have a point to make, so indulge me, please. Quiet. Stoic. The opposite of Trixie. She is the exact opposite. She comes across as being completely... Uh, showing nothing but disdain for how she originally was. And frankly, I don't like character developments like that at all. Because it seems like, rather than developing on the character that was already there, it comes across to me as completely erasing it and replacing it with characteristics which the author regards as superior. See, I would disagree with you on that, because I think this sounds more like a natural progression over three decades of life. I wanted to see it bust out some card tricks. Here is how I would see a natural progression. Natural progression involves embracing your flaws and working them into your character as a more positive trait. For example, Trixie's, as she's portrayed in the show, is clearly ambitious. She's clearly driven. She's got an ego. All of which are extremely imp uh, good characteristics for someone who's pushing the bounds of magic. And yet... Yeah, she does do that. She is the head researcher, is it, of the project? And she said that she made great leaps and bounds in the field of magical study with gesture-based magic before she gave up and at the princess's request came and worked on this. So she still has that ambition. So that's still maintained in her character. But I would object to saying this is completely antithetical to the trickery of the show because I would challenge anyone to say, in 30 years' time, everything I am now, I am still going to be. I couldn't actually say 10 years ago I was a completely different person. So in 10 years, it can change. And 30 years, it's a big time frame to look at for her character to have changed this much, yes. But there are enough elements of her character there... I didn't see them. ...to at least make it recognisable. I see, I did. I honestly didn't see them because... I will agree to disagree with you on that one. Because I thought okay. that was the only successful bit of the fic. One element which I actually did notice where I thought I saw a fair bit of Trixie's past was in regards to those trophies when Russet pulled them out and she kind of flipped out and was like, you know, put those away, I don't want to see those. I kind of saw it as though that was the darkest, lowest point in her life. Twilight saved her. She, you know, 35 years of working beyond that, she wanted to try to ignore as much of that as she possibly could and seeing those trophies brought that back to her and that's why she was sort of had that full thing of you know look to the future not the past the past reminds you of what you can't do the future is full of all the things you can achieve and all those sort of things and that's why i sort of thought of her as trying to block out as much of the past before those 35 years as she possibly could and that's how i kind of saw her character in this Kubasa? I really liked the way that Trixie is portrayed in this story, mostly because this is something that I think I see a lot of in fan fiction in general. When someone tries to write older characters, they oftentimes just make them the same, just making them a little bit older and slower and maybe with a hip replacement here and there. But for the most part, I like the fact that this Trixie is so much different than canon Trixie. The fact that she has had 30 years of reflection to look at her life and what she did before. She is somebody who, at this point in her life, is at peace with herself and with the world. And I like that portrayal. It feels like a natural progression, and it feels like this author captured the idea of getting older much better than the youthfulness that Russet was supposed to represent. Saucy? I would disagree that she seems to be at peace with herself, because once again, this is my perception of it, she seems to have done a complete character 180. And I know I'm, I'm probably just beating a dead horse here, pardon the pun, ha. but I just don't think... Oh, I've said this already. Never mind. Ilya? Well, she did have the awards in her drawer until that last moment and she was never able to throw them away before until that last moment yes she changed but probably much more so in these last few hours than she had all her life as someone who has lived six decades 
I know this sort of change is possible. Can't say how quickly it would happen to someone like Trixie, but it's possible. I don't know how I feel about saying that she's the complete antithesis of who she was before, but she's certainly in her outlook and in her sort of countenance, she is opposed to the person that she was before. And when we have that saying that she's at peace with who she is, she still hides the stuff she's done because she's afraid of becoming brash and arrogant. She's afraid of taking on traits of that person that she was. And that, to me, doesn't really smack of being at peace. That seems to be sort of almost a on a path to deny what she thinks is an element of herself because she's terrified of it overtaking her life. Like if she spends even a moment looking back at this incredible thing she did that she'll never look forward. It, it feels like a person who will never be satisfied with her own life. It sounds like someone who's on course for some kind of terrible anxiety problem that she can never be satisfied with the things that she has done. She can never look back at anything she's done with any kind of satisfaction because the risk of doing so is to invite self-destructive tendencies. She doesn't sound like a healthy individual when the things that she says here were well, all put together. Reverb? I thought that she actually still retained quite a lot of her brashness as well in the way that she talked to Russet and Twilight and basically just cutting him off, telling him to sort of, you know, shut up or, you know, I'll do this or, you know, Russet's crying and she's like, no, you know, this is the way it is. Do you, is there anything you wanted to say to them sort of, you know, I still thought that she retained quite a lot of her brashness. Glad you brought that up, because I had very negative feelings towards that bit. How do we feel about how the fic and the characters in that fic dealt with this encroaching instance of death that lurked at the end of the story? Saucy. I think it's incredibly condescending and trying to be a lot... It's trying to be deep without having depth. It was no 127 hours, that's for sure. Definitely, because um, I can understand Trixie, she's lived a full life. I can understand this incarnation of the character, if we accept that character, having that laid-back approach. However, I think projecting that on a 21-year-old university student and trying to say, yes, that's the right way for you to be as well, and that, oh no, don't don't be sad, Everything everything's happy, you ha you've, you've lived a wonderful life. Like, no, he hasn't! He's 21! He's barely lived! That's a fucking tragedy. Yeah, it was kind of tragic for him. Ah, uh, I know, I know. Poor guy. Ilya? Well, I was a little bit conflicted about Trixie because I felt like, yes, with age, she would be able to accept her death a little bit better. I know that's true. But on the other hand, at times during the story, it seemed like she was always... Ah, finally, I'm going to die. I mean, it almost felt like that to me a couple of times. Like she welcomed it or something. Saucy? There was a moment right after Russet's off-screen death. The author describes Trixie as feeling an inexplicable calm. And how is that different to how she's been in the rest of the fic? Because all she's done is just sat there and talked about, okay, it's everything's okay, I'm dying now, Russet's dying, we'll accept this. Doesn't that seem a little odd? It really does. The last third of this fic, I thought, was my least favourite. I thought it detracted from the fic by being there. Everything from the moment Trixie picks up the radio and starts speaking to Twilight, I think was superfluous to the story. My reason for this is the biggest point that Trixie has to say to Russet throughout is you don't need to say anything to your family and your loved ones. They already know. And you should take peace from the fact you'll never get to speak to them, but everything you could say to them would just be reaffirming what they already know. And then Trixie picks up the radio and says a bunch of stuff to Twilight about her regrets. And that felt to me disingenuous that she's giving this life advice to a 21-year-old boy and then ignoring her own advice later on. But the story doesn't treat that like it's a problem. We have Trixie saying, oh, this is all important. Trixie doesn't say anything that's really relevant. She doesn't say anything we needed to know. We already know she really loves Twilight as a friend or whatever. We already know she has regrets. We already know she wants to pass on this information. But the fact that the story that has it all said 
It detracts from the message Trixie's trying to give about how you shouldn't look back because everything she's saying there is a regret. The establishment of the character up until that point is that she's a character who rejects the concept of regret. It's all about forward motion. And her whole existence in that room up until the point that Russet passes away is making sure Russet doesn't freak out. That's all she's doing. She's talking to him to keep him calm. There, she does nothing else. She tells stories. And that she gets the radio, but that's Russet's idea. Everything else is, I need to stop Russet freaking out. And then when Russet's gone, she freaks out. And that, to me, seems against the character that's been established prior to that moment. Scribbling, you may have your counter-argument. Well, it's not actually a counter-argument. It's just a comment I wanted to make. We talked in Puppet about how there were some elements of the story that, had they been retained and condensed and sharpened to be the story, would have been better. I think the the first half, the first two thirds of the story were superfluous. And I reckon the story would have been much, much better if it had started with Trixie picking up the radio. And I think this half of the story was the only part that really counted. Because to me, that was where the emotional impact for me came from. And yes, it was manipulative, but I felt that this was better written than everything that had come before it. Kabasa? Like I said, the second half of the story felt more genuine and more organic to me than all of the conversation that Trixie was having with Russet. And I didn't think anything was lost when she started talking with Twilight, because at that point, that was really when I started to get invested in the story, especially as it goes on and on, and slowly the narration disappears, and it becomes a back-and-forth dialogue between Trixie and Twilight up until the point when Trixie is completely pulled into the void and disappears. I will make the argument then. The Trixie we see up until the point she picks up the radio is not the Trixie we see after she does that. They're two different characters. It's two different stories. As you've said, you don't get interested until the second half. The half of it is superfluous. This story was either Trixie... I mean, that was the thing that I thought was interesting, the void as this consuming force. I thought there was going to be something about destruction, annihilation of past... Trixie hates who she was. She hates every aspect of who she was. And I got the feeling there was going to be some sort of revelation about her previous self. There was this wholesale rejection of everything she'd been. And that the only thing that mattered to her was what was she was going to do. And the moment Russa exited the story, there was nothing left for her to do. I was under the impression she was going to throw the radio into the void. And along with all of the awards that she'd had, because there was nothing left. All there was was waiting to get eaten by a terrible black thing. Saucy? I think it's just a little point. Now, interesting to note that we were referring to this as the second half, the last third of the story, when it's 1,500 words out of an 8,000 word story. Ilya? Yeah, I just want to say that I thought the whole story was basically a... It was sort of a long Trixie denouement with Twilight. It was all about Trixie and Trixie's relation to Twilight. The OC was in there for the exposition. And the reason that she spoke differently to Russet than she did to Twilight was that she was trying to calm Russet. That made sense to me, and that doesn't mean that she was internally completely calm, even though they did have that moment where they said she was. But when she had to finally face the moment of her death in the presence of her friend, we saw something, I think, that we'd never seen in Trixie before. And I rather liked that. I thought that was nice. Scribbler? I agree with Ilya. I think that um, when you're with someone else in a crisis, you can supersede your own emotions with theirs, with the idea of keeping them calm, of looking after them, of making sure they're okay. And it's only at that moment where you have to face your own emotions and you have this inevitability of something terrible is going to happen that you find out how you yourself would deal with them if you don't have that buffer of, I need to stay calm because so-and-so is here. Reverb. The way I kind of saw it is kind of like the author just trying to squeeze out as much tragedy as they possibly can. It's like we got as much out of Russet, now is gone. Now Trixie's the only one left. Let her talk to Twilight. Let her squeeze out all her sadness and sorrow as well before finishing the fic. Saucy? I would agree with Reverb there. One thing that I did want to touch on as well, though, how does everyone else feel about Trixie's message from Russet that she passes on to Twilight? Oh, yeah. Can't remember what it was again. Her saying that he wanted his family to know that he loved them, that it did, and one thing she said was he wants them to know that it didn't go to waste. 
all the sacrifices they'd made. All the money and stuff. Yeah, it didn't go to waste just because he died horribly in tragedy in this pointless exercise. And honestly, that was the point where the fic lost me completely, because she spends the entire fic not letting Russet speak, putting words into his mouth. After he dies, yeah. And then she passes those words on. It seems to be sort of erasing the whole tragedy of the situation and, and trying to... Yeah. And I just lost all sympathy with the character at that point. I don't know if anyone else had that impression at all. So you make a good point that she spends a considerable amount of time telling him how to think because he's panicking. So she tells him how to think. And then I think you're right in saying she puts words in his mouth. And then after he's dead, she puts loads of words into his mouth. An entire paragraph. Yeah, it, it is actually. It's a, it's a complete paragraph. I don't think there's any breaks in it. That's true, actually. I think that's entirely fair. Yeah. I don't think she outright lied, except every single part of that she fully coaxed out of him. Sort of like, you know, a, a case of leading the witness I sort of thing. I don't think it's even a case of coaxing it out. It's a case of her telling him that. And then him sort of going, oh, okay, if you think so. Yes, it is. She, she says, do you know how you feel? And he says, no. And she just says, well, you feel like this. And he's, okay, that makes sense. Thank you, Miss Trixie. And then no, that... she doesn't, he doesn't even do that. He's like... He's, he's like that's one way, that's that's sort of... And then before he can even say yes to that, she just carries And then at the end of it, she gives this entire paragraph. To, Tell them he said not to worry. He was satisfied. He wants to thank them for all they've done for it. And that's, <laughs> he never said that. Like, that's what God. you said. That's not what he said. You didn't give him a chance to say anything. You're totally right. She's such an asshole. God damn it. Maybe Trixie <laughs> hasn't changed that much. I actually, I have no regret. I don't care that she died now. Fuck her. I'm glad. I'm glad she had to cry. I'm glad Sathisto's not here to hear you talk about trips you <laughs> like. <that. laughs> I'm going to point out that there is absolutely no way, no matter how many of us submit this, we're not getting an EQD anymore. <laughs> we never get <laughs> a fucking of course. EQD. Right, oh. Saucy, make that point that we've been talking about. But there was also another point as well against the character of Trixie in this fic. She's a complete bitch to him earlier in the story as well. She kind of is. <laughs> I was like, when she's talking about the character of Holly, who's this character who's not there, and she says to Russet, I remember being impressed by the two of you in, in very different ways. And then she goes on to say, Holly was so smart and pretty and funny all round. And of course, you're completely different to that. You pathetic waste of space. <laughs> yeah, she she's said, like, oh, well, I, I hired Holly because she's really good at science, like what we're doing. And I hired you because... And I hired you because I knew your mum and dad. You got here because I know your mum and dad. And I believe that's... Pretty much outright said? No, we've cracked the code. This story was not meant to be a tragedy. It's a oh comedy my God, in disguise. This would have been such a good comedy. <laughs> Shut up, potato boy. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish there was an ending now where they got rescued and Russet was really pissy. That would have been brilliant. That would be fantastic. Oh, I'm going to make a bold statement then and say that. This story had no idea what it was about, and the most interesting part was when it figured out what it was about, which is Trixie dying in front of Twilight. That was what the story was. was. Indeed. It was Trixie has regrets, and she shares them with her friend before she dies. And that more or less, to me, contradicts the first chunk of the story. The overall chunk of the story is Trixie is a stoic who rejects her regrets of the past. And that is such a lie that it makes the first 6,500 words to me just worthless because we don't learn anything about her. We learn a bunch of events that happen sequentially, but the characterization that we see prior to her picking up that radio it's not the character that we actually care about for the remainder of the story. It's... Ugh. And once again, she gets a chance to express all her regrets. Oh, yeah. What does Russet get? He gets to die. You're not allowed to express your regrets, little 21-year-old who hasn't had a chance to do anything. I've lived a long, full life and got to do all sorts of wonderful things. But I, but my regrets are far more important. The things I didn't get to do That's are far more important. That's because she has The great and seniority. regretful Trixie has way more regrets than you. I love this, that you don't get to express your regrets. You didn't deserve to die in this laboratory. I did. So shut up.
I don't really care about what Potato Boy's regrets are. That really is Trixie, though. You You're can't right. say that she's she wasn't. She hasn't character. changed. Yes, she yeah. is entirely I, in character. I recant, Thank you. I recant. As do I. She is the Trixie we know and love. It's just she, she was wearing a very clever disguise for the first chunk of the fic. Oh, God. Isn't it also convenient that Twilight was only there at the end after he died to offer to come and get like them out? Minutes. And she's like, nah, minutes nah, we're fine. <laughs> let us die, let us die, we're all right. Do you think Twilight had been trying to get through for a while, even when Russet was alive and Trixie just ignored the radio? She probably had the radio off. Or what did she... Oh my God. <laughs> this is far more tragic now. I, the great and regretful Trixie needs to have her moment of her death scene. Oh my like, God. Trixie, really? Is she going to go off in her bed one day? No, she's going to go out in a way that's memorable. Wait, Russet to die. Oh, I'm glad that's over and done with. Now to get out of here. That's my show pony. That's her. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, he dies off screen while she's monologuing about herself. She talks over his death. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, you did? Uh, I well, think I'm... I like this fic more. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, he saves the radio just in case for a backup, and she's like, no, I'll turn this off. We don't want someone interrupting my story and possibly saving us. Or you, I'm gonna you tell know, 21-year-old. I'm going to tell you about what it was like when I did... Sh she doesn't even do a fucking card trick for him. I was waiting for that. <laughs> she was like, don't worry, you were thinking of an ace. And he'd be like, oh, you're right, I was. <laughs> I was waiting for something like that, but now she's just, she just fucking mopes. She mopes until he dies, and then she cries everywhere and And then dies. she complains whenever he tries to mope as well. It's true. Oh, oh man. God. God, fuck Trixie. That is our Trixie, though. That, that really... is our Trixie. I actually feel like the story has improved because of this discussion. Yeah. <laughs> I do hope that the author links this in the description of the story as an endorsement. Oh, oh God. Yeah. Oh, no, like, no, yeah, yeah, right. If I get any more hate mail, I'm blaming all of you. Now, underneath that endorsement for Ilya's beautiful reading, there could be, and then Ilya talked shit about me with his friends. Here's the recording <laughs> of that. <laughs> Subscribe. There's no such thing as bad advertisement. Indeed. It's true. Well put. There is the one last thing, the elephant in the room, that we do need to address, I think. Because it's the part in the last 1500 words, which I feel was just completely out Which is where Trixie and Twilight confess their love for each other at the end. Now, first of all, it's not explicitly said that this is a romantic love. It could well be just platonic love. But I don't think that needs to go said. I think that is, once again... Trixie just making it all about her. <laughs> Scribbler? I kind of like that. And that's simply because you don't get many stories where a character would say, I love you, but not mean romantically. So I kind of like the fact that a character was willing to say it and mean it platonically. I think that, given that we're suggesting this is actually the Trixie we know and love, but wearing a clever disguise, I would say that... <sighs> It's kind of appropriate because the great and emotional Trixie doesn't hold back. That's certainly where I, I feel the character was at that stage. I find it weird that Twilight said it back. I could see Trixie saying it because Twilight saved Trixie. But Twilight... Uh... But again, this is 30 years later. And for all we know at this point, Twilight's lost half of her friends. So she's, she's getting in the I love yous before she loses everybody. One thing I do want to ask, though... Do we think the author meant it as romantic or platonic? Because I think the author did probably intend romantic. That's the impression I got. I reckon it was platonic because the Trixie says, you're my best friend. I thought platonic as well. I lean more towards platonic as well, mostly for the reason that Scribbler mentioned, because Trixie refers to her as her best friend. I don't really see somebody referring to someone as their best friend and then saying, I love you in the most homosexual way possible. It's true. <laughs> got full on homo. Especially because she, she would have used those last... She knows she's going to die. She knows there's going to be no repercussions. If she was going to confess her love, it would have been then. Yep. During her monologue, she would have said, I've always loved you. And mm. Brony fandom, it is possible for two characters to stand next to each other and not be in a relationship. You wash your mouth out. Very true. It is possible to say the words, I love you, and it not mean, do I go to bed? For example, I love all of you. Ilya, do you have any further statements about how you love people? Well, you know... There was that one night with Twilight and... <laughs> <laughs> oh, please narrate it. <laughs> now I just have this picture of Ilya and Twilight sitting drunkenly at a cider bar together. So do I. What a coincidence. 
<laughs> I feel like the situation could have been avoided if she just said, I love you, Twilight, brackets, no homo, brackets. And that would have <laughs> spelled out all of oh, the oh, oh, oh. characters. <laughs> but no, we're left with... This is how biblical schisms happen. I was worried that we were getting off to a really slow start when we first started talking about this story. But Much like this fic, oh, it's like picked up in the last fifth. Yeah, there we go, bringing it full circle. <laughs> All right. Does anyone want to add anything to the proclamations of love, or can we end it on this high note? I think we should end it on a high note. End on a bang rather than a whimper, which is not what Twitchy did. And with an absolute astonishment, we have ended this fic with me enjoying it more than I did prior to the discussion, which I don't think has happened before. And hang on, but we have to ask Saucy the same thing. His raison d'etre for being in this review is to make me hate it. Saucy, how do you feel about it now? I failed. <laughs> After going through this, I still don't like this fic. I still think it is completely meandering and it doesn't know what it wants to be. It doesn't know what its purpose is. However, my biggest complaint going into this was that Trixie was massively out of character. I'm not sure I can stand by that anymore. I do think raised some, some good points about that. And we do see, as has been revealed, plenty of the original Trixie shining through. So my main complaint has been addressed. I'm feeling slightly more friendly to this pick now. If only Russell had been more interesting, this whole negative feeling could have been avoided because you would have seen more of the Trixie we know and love. Gubasa, your final thoughts? I do think that this story is still worth a read, if only for the secondary part of it. Yeah, read it for Trixie and read it for the emotional ending between Trixie and Twilight. But be warned, it's very difficult to get into the beginning. Dreverb? I think the reading by Ilya and I Am Shadow 007 was absolutely fantastic, and they pull off the emotions really, really well. I think that is really well done, but I never want to experience this fic again. Scribbler? I am still pretty indifferent to this fic. <laughs> that didn't change. Sorry, Saucy, you failed on that one too. I can accept that. And I just want to quickly echo what Reverb said as well. Listen to Ilya and I Am Shadow 007's reading because it is fantastic. It is. I Am Shadow and Ilya do a fantastic version of this. If you like the brief snippets of Ilya's voice you've heard at the moments where me and Dev haven't been drowning him out completely, then you'll love the reading. And just read, listen to all this stuff because that voice! Yeah. We should say Ilya and I Am Shadow, I'll echo once again, make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. We, I would say round of applause, but it'll just be a deafening noise. So, Ilya, your closing thoughts? I feel much like I did going into this. It's just a bit too slow in the beginning. So, if you're going to listen to the story, I'd say go get a cup of coffee or something while the first part's on and wait for the I Am Shadow emotional bit at the end. Because every time I hear her do that, I cry myself. It's that good. Yeah, if you're going to read it, control F, picked up the radio, and then read from there and skim the beginning bit if you want further context. Or you can go listen to I'm Shadow Act on the internet and it's glorious. Okay, thank you very much for listening. This was The Heroic Review, reviewing The Incandescent Brilliance by Kitsune Risu. Joining me was Brain by Saucepans. Thank you for listening to me ramble. Kubasa. Bye bye, everybody. Ilya. Good day, everyone. Reverb. Take care. Thanks for listening. Scribbler. Be lovely to each other and good night, everybody. I was the moderator slash loudmouth Deadly Reg, and once again, thank you for listening.